This is my first year at bar camp, and I am also speaking, so I'm just jumping in with both feet here. Uh, I do want to start with two little disclaimers. Um, first of all, if you're an Apple fanboy, I'm sorry, I'm going to rain on your parade. <laughs> so just deal with it. <laughs> Secondly, this is a chat about coding, so I will probably end up on some nerdy bunny trails. Forgive me, I'll try to stay on track as best I can. So a little bit about me. Um, I have lived in Nebraska my entire life, uh, born and raised here. Lived most of my life in Omaha and then down a small town called Weeping Water for a while as well. Um, I'm married to the beautiful Dallas. We have one two-year-old and we have another one on the way come November. So life is pretty crazy right now. <laughs> I went to UNO for a studio art degree um, and did the A to B uh, degree with Metro. So I went to both places. Took it for graphic design, but I also took a number of classes in like animation and 3D design and stuff like that so I could get a good feel across all of it. Decided I liked graphic design the best, but as time went on, kept running into stuff with wanting to do programming because I was doing freelancing. So building websites and such, I was like, well, probably should learn this. So started learning it about halfway through college, just messing around with WordPress. Um, Started with HTML and CSS, moved into PHP and JavaScript as time went on. Um, just started working at Grain and Mortar six months ago, and it has been an awesome time there. It's a great group of guys and gals, and I have learned so much working there. Uh, predominant languages, I work in PHP, JavaScript, MySQL, and HTML and CSS, even though it's not technically a programming language. <laughs> so. Coding bar camp, um, gosh, it was about early September when we started actually hashing out the design work. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the staff at Grain and Mortar, but Eric and Jesse were the ones who did most of the design work on that. And I got to watch them go through it from the first inception of idea on to actually fleshing out the site in Illustrator. And I was like, okay, I got to mess with this when you guys get ready for coding. And I was like, please, let me code this. <laughs> So I was looking at it going, this is going to be challenging, but I was looking for a chance to start messing with CSS animations and some of the other cutting edge technology. So I was, I was like, you guys have got to let me do this. And thankfully they did. So it, it was crazy, it was difficult and frustrating, but I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on each of the points. I want to try to leave some time open for questions. If, as I'm going, you have a specific question, go ahead and flag me down. Otherwise, I'll try to leave about 10 minutes or so at the end of the talk to go over stuff. Um, if an answer is going to be too long, I'll just catch you guys after and go and explain, because I know some of the stuff can be like 10 to 15 minutes to explain. So, things that I learned with doing bar camp. Device independent design is hard, especially if you're working in the Android world. You have screen sizes, everything from a Nokia phone on up to iPads, laptops. And it's difficult, too, because you've got input devices of keyboards and mice to touch screens to a little directional pad. And, I mean, everything from how you approach the design to approach the coding is different across all the devices. And yet, it is not good practice to have a separate mobile website. So you have to try to take all these disparate elements and match your content and your design to work with all of those. We got lucky with Barcamp because it's a one-page, mostly informational site with mostly, I guess it was pretty much all illustration. If you guys looked at it, you can tell that Jesse and Eric had a lot of fun with it. We wanted to try to make it um, so that we had the full rack of animations on all the devices and be able to use all the illustrations that we did. But unfortunately, due to processing limitations, memory limitations, we had to make a lot of sacrifices on the way through. And the thing to remember when you're doing, especially cutting edge um, design for the myriad of devices out there, is the performance and the experience are what matters the most. Even if you have to cut the animation that is just gorgeous, do it anyway, because people appreciate it when the website works and works well. Secondly, SVGs were the future in 1999. There's a lot of people nowadays, especially over probably the last year or so, that have really been pushing, use SVGs, use SVGs. I really didn't start working with them until I did stuff with grain and mortar, and let me tell you, they are awesome. Essentially, it's scalable vector graphics. It's an Illustrator file 
that is an XML format that can be read both as code in the page and as an image. Um, they're completely resolution independent, so whether the image is full screen or three pixels across, it is perfectly sharp because the browser pulls it up and then rasterizes it to what size you've got it. And then if it resizes it, it'll re-raster it. Um, they're perfect for if you have um, icons or logos or illustration. They do not work with photos. Any pixel-based image that relies on a lot of color information is not going to work with an SVG because all of the shapes and lines and such are built with code. It makes way too large of a file. But anything beyond photos, you really should be using them. Compatibility, they are basically supported in everything but IE, which is no surprise. <laughs> um, pretty much, if you are designing for anything above IE8, you are safe to use them. If you have to use IE8 for something, like if you're doing a banking website or maybe something that's an industrial company or such, where traditionally you're going to have people visiting a site that are using older browsers, you can use Modernizer as a shim that'll go through and detect, okay, you're on a browser that does not support SVGs, and it can go through and swap them for an equivalent PNG. It works really well, but honestly, if you're doing modern web design, don't bother with it. SVGs are remarkably simple. This is all the code it takes to make a heart. So you have an opening and closed tag of SVG, a few explanations of the size and such, and then it's just a path. The awesome thing about SVGs is you can add, if you just put the code right into the page, you can give it an ID or a class and affect it with CSS. So you could have this heart in a page and you could give it an ID of icon heart or whatever, and then you could use CSS to be like, I'm going to make it red. And then maybe when they click on it, you could use JavaScript to switch the class to something else and then change it to blue. And it's all accessible by the style sheet. It is so fun to work with. So with BarCamp, originally we wanted to do the entire website with SVGs. That didn't quite work out though. One of the unique things about mobile is you have some very serious limitations on both memory and processing speed. And since the page not only has to render pixels, it also has to calculate the SVG. It's a smaller file size, but a little more processing power. So when you pull up a site that has 40 or 50 SVGs, which is what we ended up with by the time we finished, the browser would pull it all up, hang for a second, go black, and crash <laughs> on iPad and iPhone. I, and like I said in the description, I'm going to teach you how to crash Safari over and over again. I, I think probably on average every day, I crashed our iPad probably about 40 or 50 times every single day working with this. Uh, ultimately, what we had to end up doing was we did a 50-50 mix of PNGs and SVGs. Um, a lot of our background images that were the full screen stuff, we would do PNGs because it was less information for the browser to render. And then smaller elements, um, we did SVGs. Interestingly, Android has a bit of a problem with SVG rendering. If you animate it using CSS where it moves, it, how do I explain this? Basically, since it converts it from vector to raster when it shows it on the page, it won't resize it properly, so you end up with blurry SVGs on a high pixel density display. So if you're doing animation work that's moving stuff, PNGs actually tend to work a little better. Now I don't know what the most recent version of Android does because I'm running 4.1, I believe, and we're up to 4.2 now, so they may have fixed some of that with the most recent browser. Um, but the interesting thing is when you get onto the Barcamp website, you're looking through it on an iPad, pretty much everything on it is perfectly sharp. And the reason for that is it is actually possible to make JPEGs and PNGs look good on high pixel density displays. The trick to it is you export your images at double the size you need, and then you use CSS to size them back down 50%. To help with file size, with PNGs and JPEGs, you can upload them. There's a website called Smush It that Yahoo does. It's smush.it. And then there's tinypng.org. And both of those let you upload images. And it'll go through and strip off all the metadata and EXIF information and give you a much smaller file size. 
And I mean, I have had a couple of them where I've cropped almost 75% of the size of the image off, especially on like one or two color images. The other thing you can do that's specifically JPEG is when you export them at double size, run them out, I think it's 75% quality, because you got a slider for how um, the quality setting. If you run them out at 75%, they do look blurry, but then when you take them back down 50%, they look perfectly sharp. And the weird thing is, you can have a 300 by 300 and a 600 by 600 pixel JPEG, and if you've done all the stuff to the bigger one, the bigger one is actually smaller by almost, I think it's like 20% than the smaller one. It's bizarre, but it looks really awesome on high pixel density displays, and you really can't tell that it's a JPEG. How is that? Just a sec. Yeah. Uh, I was at a talk at uh, Code Camp in Lincoln mm -hmm. this fall, and, or this uh, summer, and there was a guy who did an all day work, uh, workshop on responsive design. Okay. He actually suggested exporting your JPEGs at 0% quality. Really? At 2 times the largest resolution you're going to use. Huh. So and that would be 2.2 2 times your double resolution for your iPad. Oh, so it's actually like 440%? Yeah. <laughs> I guess, it, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just mess with it. And then the 0% that was resized mm -hmm. actually ended up looking better than the native resolution one. Really? At 100%. Yeah, you guys will just have to mess with it. I found pretty good results at about 75. I've got a side project that I'm using um, PHP to do some resizing and editing. That one tends to look better at about 80%. So it's just find a happy medium. The point is you can run them out at a lot lower quality setting and then use CSS to crush them down and they still look awesome. Next, Retina iPads are not magical. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's two big reasons why this is. And don't get me wrong, the Retina iPad is gorgeous. When we first got done doing the first version of Bar Camp with all the SVGs and all the animation, it was awe-inspiring to see everything perfectly sharp, animating smoothly, and then you rotate it to landscape. <laughs> <laughs> the Retina display has over 3.1 million pixels on it that the processor has to redraw, and it's redrawing it at somewhere between 30 and 60 frames per second on a decently fast web page. When you rotate it, it is going through and redrawing the entire page because you changed the screen size. When you've got one big long page with all these images on it, that it suddenly has to figure out where's the image at, how big is it, how do I draw it, it basically goes <gasps> and just stops. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is because iOS throttles the amount of memory that's available for each app on the system, and when the app overruns it, iOS says, no, no more memory. So what you run into is Safari says, hey, I got a big page that I got to rewrite, I need 200k of memory. And iOS says, no soup for you. And <laughs> Safari goes, okay, and just drops it and walks out. <laughs> And what happened was you'd load the, or you'd rotate it, it would hang for a second black, and then just drop back to the home screen instantly. And I think we fought with this thing for about three days, trying to do everything from pause the animations to use JavaScript to detect an orientation event, which turns out the orientation event happens after the rotation, so you can't catch anything with it. So we ultimately had to go through and cut down how much stuff was in the page, which is why we lost a lot of the SVGs, so that we could get the memory usage down far enough that it wouldn't crash on rotation. Now this may have been fixed in iOS 7, I have not had a chance to mess around with it, and it also does not do that on iPhone. So it's something about redrawing the amount of pixels that are on a Retina iPad that causes it to fail. So the trick with that is keep your pages small if you can, especially with images. And as a quick side note for both this and with SVGs, um, you can use SVGs as background images with CSS using the background property. Don't do it. With um, Safari on both iPhone and iPad, when you scroll past an SVG that's a background or try to zoom on it, again, freeze the browser and crash. <laughs> so that's the one thing you unfortunately cannot use SVGs for. Targeting mobile in CSS is actually pretty easy. Um, this was another thing that we had to end up working with to try to get the page to work well on um, iPads and iPhones and such. We were running into some pretty serious performance issues with our CSS animations. 
So one of the things I discovered is with media queries in CSS, you can target both the device width, but you can also target the orientation. Now the only things that have an orientation property are tablets and phones. So what this does is you can have your Chrome window on your Mac laptop or whatever at 400 pixels, but since it doesn't have a uh, rotation or orientation property, it will not apply these properties. So what we could do was go through and target all of our CSS animations. And what I did was I did orientation landscape and orientation portrait to get both of the um, directions that it would be, depending on how they're holding it. And then I could go through and say, basically, if you're on a mobile device, don't play the CSS animations, because that was another thing that caused a lot of crashing. And that leads me to CSS animation is better than JavaScript animation, which by the way, if none of you have heard of AxCop, go look it up, it is hilarious. <laughs> um, so CSS animations versus JavaScript animations. Interestingly, CSS is baked into the browser. It's part of the programming in there. So when you do something with CSS, it's actually machine level code versus JavaScript, which is interpreted on runtime. What you get from that is CSS processes faster and runs faster because it has quicker access to the CPU. Whereas JavaScript, when the page comes up, the browser actually has to read through all the JavaScript, figure out what it's doing, and then actually do it. And it also is much more susceptible to your processor speed because we, gosh, I think we ended up with about three or four of the original animations we had running a combination of JavaScript and CSS, specifically, um, with this particular part of the website. The little guy, he floats up and down, and when he gets to the bottom, he burps, and then the little bubbles appear, and then float up and disappear. <clears throat> Originally, we had CSS running the guy moving up and down, and then we had JavaScript running, making the bubbles appear and float up. Well, since one of them is an interpreted language and one of them is native to the browser, you would get out of sync because the clock speed of the two, you'd have CSS, which is like running perfectly in sync with the computer, and they have JavaScript, which is susceptible to how fast it can process the page. So slowly, the JavaScript would be running a tiny bit slower than the CSS would. And pretty soon, you'd end up with he go down and burp, and then come back up, and then all the bubbles would appear. And then they float away as they went back down. And it was so annoying. This was another thing that we spent two or three days trying to figure out. And I finally discovered that the two get out of sync. So when you're doing stuff, at least with self-contained animations, you want to do all JavaScript or all CSS because it'll keep them in sync. And interestingly, um, timing, so like with JavaScript, you can set like an interval or a timeout for a certain number of milliseconds. You can do that with CSS as well. The two are actually not the same. One second in CSS is not one second in JavaScript. So as a general rule, don't mix and match the two, and if you can, use CSS animations. They're insanely powerful. Uh, yeah. Did you experiment with the request animation frame at all for those? Or just I did not, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> we can talk about that. Okay. Yeah, I, I started digging into this, and I quickly realized this is an incredibly deep rabbit hole <laughs> for both JavaScript and CSS. Um, this is an example for any of you that are not familiar with how CSS animations work. Essentially, super top level, you're setting an animation, you give it a name, a time interval, the uh, easing function, whether it's just a straight A to B, or if it like goes slow, fast and slow, and then how long the animation lasts. So this is the code for at the bottom of the website, there's a little guy that runs back and forth hopping, and he's on fire. This is the animation that handles the guy on fire. So we're setting keyframes for the app, or for the um, animation. So over the course of 0.15 seconds, at the start of the time interval, he's at zero Y position. At 40%, he's at negative five pixels. And then 100%, he's back down to the bottom. And then it just repeats that over and over and over. Yeah? So there's some browser-specific code in there. Did, is that, did you use a tool to help you generate the, like the WebKit transform and all that stuff? Or did you have to actually memorize the different browser keys so that you can type that all in? This I actually did from scratch. Okay. Um, I think I had this at some other point in my talk, but I'll just go over it now. With um, the browser prefixes, really when it comes to animation, the only one you need is WebKit. 
Opera is moving over to, or already has moved over to the WebKit engine, so the slash O is no longer needed. Slash MS is supported in IE9 only, and they did a pretty pathetic job of it, and they removed it in IE10, so there's no need for Internet Explorer. And then slash Moz for Mozilla, they dropped the need for that for animation like two years ago or something. So really the only one you need is the slash WebKit and the regular, and with all the um, animation stuff, it's all the same properties, you just add dash WebKit dash to it. So. Okay. You need to give up on IE8. I know I'm <laughs> preaching to the choir on this, but it actually somewhat includes IE9. So as we all are well aware of, IE8 sucks at pretty much everything. <laughs> Specifically, with the cutting edge of web stuff, it does not support animation, CSS effects, SVGs, or media queries. Now obviously you're not going to have IE8 running on a phone, but specifically, if you're doing stuff that absolutely relies on animation or SVGs for icons and such, it gets to be a real pain in the butt trying to support stuff with this. And even IE9, the stuff that they support with uh, CSS animations I think is like super basic like translating and scaling and that's it. And a lot of the shims that they have don't work very well. So honestly, just give up on it. <laughs> if you have to support it, you can use uh, stuff like modernizer.js which does a pretty good job of adding classes to the body to say hey it doesn't support it and then you can try to work around it most of the time, we just end up dropping um, support for stuff like animation with this. Microsoft is actually putting a timeline on getting rid of IE8 because on, I think it's like April 15th of 2014, they are officially dropping XP as a support item. They're no longer pushing bug releases, yes. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's what they say. I mean, until we know. They, until they can get corporate America to move on, they're, they're kind of stuck. Yeah. They've been pushed back in several years. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and then you look at, okay, the next thing was Vista. So it, it's going to be a slow transition. But that being said, now that Microsoft is saying goodbye to IE8, those of us who are web developers have a very good excuse for saying, we're not going to do it either. If you need it, it's a big extra charge. Yeah. With, with this one, we didn't bother, actually, because it was such a one-off, yeah. odd thing. My general philosophy with working with IE8 is the basic content needs to appear in a vaguely readable format. That's all we really worry about. So we do a quick check to make sure, because we had one project we did where in IE8 all the content was like crammed off at 2% wide on the side of the site. So I shimmed that to be like, okay, it needs to at least be readable. But if you go there, I can't guarantee that any of the images are going to show up. None of the animation is going to work. But you can at least still get in and read the information, which is what's important. Do you kind of do that philosophy even with your general clients? Or if yeah. you're like, IEA, let's just get it to where it looks readable. Yep, and I think come January, um, as you're granted mortar, we're going to pretty much drop IE8 from our testing. And then if clients want it, we'll do it. But it's going to be extra because it's so much extra time to work with. Less, but better. I know how awesome all the frameworks and tracking codes and unique one-off scripts can be, but with the proliferation of the so-called mobile web, page size is incredibly important. Um, with an HTTP request, so when your browser asks the server for files, two minutes, all right, um, with a cell phone, you have a bit of a delay that it has to connect to the tower before it starts pulling stuff down. So you want to make your pages as small as you can so that you can bring the information down quicker because most people are going to bounce off the website after a fairly short amount of time if it doesn't load quick. Interestingly, Barcamp fares pretty well even with all the images, the SVGs, keeping them small help a lot. We're clocking in at about 676k, downloads in about three seconds or so on a phone. So, I'm going to go ahead and drop the last one and leave it with, does anybody have any last minute short questions? <laughs>